Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Buck Haberichter, a faculty member here at the War College and one of the editors over at the War Room. Today, I'm pleased to bring you the third and final episode in our brief series about the role of economics in American grand strategy. In previous episodes, Dr. Richard New, formerly a senior economist with RAND, and Dr. Joel Hilson, a U.S. Army War College faculty member, have discussed the relationship between economics and two pillars of the most recent national security strategy, advancing American prosperity and preserving peace through strength. Today, they tackle a third pillar, advancing American influence and how economics affects this aspect of national security. We'll turn now to their discussion about how economics relates to encouraging aspiring partners, achieving better outcomes in multilateral forums, and championing American values. Now I'd like to focus on some of the external aspects of economics. And and the first one I want to talk about, which seems to be in in debate uh, these days, is U.S. leadership of the global economy, uh, our engagement with international economic institutions. So let's begin with what are the costs and benefits of U.S. economic engagement with the rest of the world? After World War II, um, the world was a wreck. Uh, Many of the economies were truly destroyed. Uh, The international system of cooperation had completely broken down and so on. And the United States, much to its credit, took the lead in rebuilding the world order Uh, politically, by establishing uh, alliances, Uh, but also, and in my view, more importantly, economically, by building a system of international trade and finance that would allow countries to benefit from each other's strengths. Even a big country like the United States can't efficiently produce everything we need and want, and much less the case for other smaller uh, countries. And the United States built an international order, an international economic order, that tremendously benefited us, tremendously benefited most of the rest of the world that was willing to participate in it. Uh, And in the process uh, created the the conditions for stability, mostly peace, (laughs) Um, and cooperation among like-minded countries. Now, this, in, in my calculation of these things, the United States was a huge net beneficiary in this regard, Um, partly in narrow economic terms, but also in larger geostrategic terms. We led the world. We made the rules. Um, Not that we forced them on other countries, but we did it largely by example and saying, wouldn't you love to be a part of this? And if you want to be a part of this very successful new world order, you need to play by our rules. Now, that doesn't mean that there weren't some costs to us. Sometimes we had to suck it up um, to give our, at the time, weaker partners and allies a break to help them get ahead. In right. some eras, we had to kind of, um, you know, allow let's use an example of Japan, to skate a little bit on some of the rules of trade. But, okay, you know, we survived it. The Japanese outgrew some of their worst practices, and now they're a strong uh, and reliable partner to us. The same with Europe, of course. We we had the Marshall Plan to right. rebuild Europe. But in later years, we we allowed the European Union some economic concessions to get their own house in order to build their union. And now we've got a bigger and stronger partner uh, in Europe. Now, 
what comes with all of these international cooperative ventures, and it, you know, they are sometimes institutionalized into organizations like the World Bank or, or the, the, IMF the or International the, Monetary right. Fund or the World Trade Organization, we give up some autonomy. Sometimes we, we have to say, all right, all right, we, yes, we will accede to the wishes and the needs of other countries. And we'll follow the rules. And, yeah, and yeah. We, we too will follow the rules. And every now and then we break the rules consciously or unconsciously, and these international institutions slap our wrists. And on our good days, we, I think, we say, okay, you're right, um, we won't do that again. But anyway, we're, we're so big and rich and confident, it, it doesn't really matter, so fine. Yeah. But uh, something has been happening in the United States in recent years. And uh, it's not fair to blame this on the current administration or the previous administration or maybe the previous previous right. administration. There's something changing in the United States. Um, the, our willingness to play with others, <laughs> to cooperate in these international forums and in the international, the global international economy that we built right. in our image of free, open, non-interference, um, that we've, seems that we, the American people, have been losing confidence in that. And I find that very troubling. Yeah, and, and that gets to this notion of collective action, and you really need a strong leader to kind of provide these public goods like liquidity, markets for distressed goods, lenders of last resort, someone to kind of enforce the rules. And certainly the institutions that we help set up with our allies and partners have helped to do this, but not being willing to carry these burdens forward is a real issue if we think this global liberal institutional framework is going to continue to yes, help I, us prosper. I, it, when I'm being pessimistic about the world, it, it is this, that the U.S. has been the leader. We were the original architect. We were the sustaining force. And now we seem to be losing interest. And again, I, as I say, I think this goes beyond any particular administration. Um, I mean, it, individual administrations can speed up or slow down this process, but it's, it's happening independently. And I trace the origins of this loss. I, what I really think it is is a loss of confidence that we, uh, in the United States, used to believe, I think, innately that yeah, whatever happens, we'll come out of it okay, so we'll be all right, and no reason to change the whole system. Now I think significant parts of the U.S. economy are beginning to question that, partly because there are people being left behind in our, uh, in our still growing prosperity, but also because we've gotten some pretty big shocks in the last few years. Um, one of those shocks was the emergence of China. Right. Now, you know, China is a huge country. It competes best right where we and our European and Japanese and Korean allies live, that is, manufacturing. Right. They don't follow the same rules we do. They have a very different idea of the way they should run their economy, which, by the way, gives them a near-term tactical, a near-term tactical advantage. I think in the long run, it's not going to work for them. They can't, their, their heavy state control is not sustainable. But in the short term, it can be very powerful because they can tell their companies, do this, do that, steal this technology, <laughs> etc. We can't do that right. in the West. Now, I think I, I still have the confidence that we will triumph eventually. But it's, it could be tough uh, in the nearer term. And I think, I fear, I worry that lots of our c fellow citizens have lost confidence about that longer term and thus this tendency to pull back from the international global economic regime. Yeah, and you mentioned this rising China and uh, you know, some of the benefits they have based on their state-directed capitalism or whatever you call their model. But there are some sh uh, shortcomings to that as far as 
responding to market signals. They really don't have to do that, or at least in the short term, they don't. Um, innovating and, and, and you know, just looking at things and being transparent, obviously they don't do that. I, I guess my question to you then is, sh- should we view this rising China, you know, lifting millions out of poverty, phenomenal growth rates, d- does that pose a threat to the United States? Uh, well, not over the long haul, I think. But in the near term, yeah. Um, they are, after all, stealing our intellectual property. Yeah. And, right. and these are the things that this is this is where America lives today. That's our comparative uh, this advantage. Is, yeah, yeah, our comparative yeah. advantage lies in being on that leading edge. Right. And that leading edge means we have the ability to control where, you know, on our good days, control where our technology goes and into whose hands it falls. And when we catch somebody cheating on us, like this Chinese firm recently, ZTE, we can come down like a ton of bricks on them, right. and we can do it. And similarly with our banking system, um, it's, it's yes, we can use our banking system to enforce um, sanctions against Iran, Russia, etc. But uh, the one that really amused me the most was that uh, because the world uses the U.S. financial system, it turns out those officials at the at FIFA, the the football, the International Soccer. Football Association, um, they by paying bribes, they were running them through American banks, so they were breaking U.S. laws, so we could get them. Right, <laughs> and it's these are great. These are great advantages from a geostrategic. And having the global point, right? sec- global currency and global banking system kind of yeah. is, is Every, to our advantage. So much f- flows through us where our officials can see it and stop it if necessary. So much in the way of modern technology comes from us. We want to stay on that cutting edge. And so, yes, China is a threat. Uh, they're, they're a threat legitimately because they are investing very heavily of their resources to try to climb up to that leading edge with us. Right. They are also a threat illegitimately because when they can't figure out how to do it themselves, they are, turns out, it seems very good at stealing from us. Right. And this this is a, a, a near-term threat. You can't keep, they can't keep doing this forever. Ultimately, this system of theirs will, I'm sure, prove sufficiently inflexible uh, that it can't compete in the long run, just like the Soviet Union couldn't compete over the long haul, just like Japan couldn't compete over the long haul. I think the same will happen to China. But in the meantime, we Watch need out. to be, yeah, we need to be vigilant. And, we're, and we seem to be tightening down on uh, some of the, especially the intellectual property with our Section yes, 301 investigations. Yes, that's the good news. The bad, you know, if ever there were a justification for a trade war or an economic war. I think the case of China today is that justification. But like any war, I mean, you never want to fight a war. You may be fairly sure you're going to win it, but everybody suffers. Right. So you, you don't want to fight it. But if you have to, you have to, if that's what it means to be a world leader. But like any war, you want to have allies. And I have to say that one of the other things that worries me is just when we should be coming we should be getting into China's face really hard on economic matters. We also seem to be estranging our natural allies. Right. And that just doesn't seem to be strategically wise. Yeah, so I I just want to push back on that a little bit on our allies, and this is kind of a devil's advocate, but, um, you know, the European Union, huge trade surpluses with the United States. NAFTA, you know, Mexico has a huge trade surplus with the United States. Um, shouldn't we focus on these trade deficits? Aren't they bad for America? No, uh, the trade deficits aren't. Um, the the counterpart to, well, to use the correct technical term, current account surpluses that these countries have with us, the counterpart to that is that there's a big capital flow from those countries into the United States. I remember some years ago, this was back during the Obama, uh, actually this was back during the Clinton administration during another panic about U.S. current account deficits and so on. And I remember Larry Summers, who uh, was the Secretary of the Treasury at the time, asking rhetorically, well, would you rather live in a country where people didn't, foreigners didn't want to invest? Right. 
And <laughs> the answer is, no, I don't want to live in that country. Um, now, sure, there's things we have to do with our trading partners. It's not principally because we have current account deficits relative to them. Uh, it's that the trade agreements we have with them have gotten old. They, uh, the world has changed. They don't do a good job at covering e-commerce. Right. They don't do a good job at covering you know, very difficult questions like data privacy. There's all kinds of things like that that they're not. And we need to update them. And we need to engage with our allies, and they won't always have the same interests that we do. But the idea of picking fights with all the people who would, on 80% of the stuff, have the same view, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China, on 80% of the issues we have with China, all these other countries have the same complaints. Right. Why don't we go after the big bully first? Yeah, and and, and, and then we'll then we'll settle our differences <laughs> with the Europeans and the Mexicans and the Canadians and the Japanese and so on. But yeah. first things first. Yeah, and I think some of this links to this notion of U.S. economic values and shared values, not not just interests that we share with our allies and trading partners, but also values. You know, the market mechanism, free markets, uh, free trade. Well, at least a yeah. Try to get freer trade, yeah. um, mm -hmm. private ownership, uh, all those things we think are good. And, and a rules-based system. And a rules-based system, right. Yeah, okay, the rules aren't perfect today, but generally our allies are following the rules. And we, you know, th that we, we benefit from the rules. We wrote them. <laughs> right. And, and you talked a little bit about this balance between um, – the current account and you know trade deficits and in, in, in investment in the United States, where we have huge amounts of trade coming from Europe. I think it's like 2.5 trillion per year, and it goes back and forth. We invest yeah, sure. heavily in them as well. Um, if we do start focusing solely on trade deficits, as you mentioned, that could hurt our well. Yeah, and without getting too complicated about it, the whole reason that the United States has a current account deficit, a big one these days, it's 2.5% of GDP, something like that, um, is largely because of an imbalance domestically. We invest more than we save. And so if you, if you really want, a, if we want to bring down our current account deficit, We've got to do one or both of two things. One of them is saving more, and that means less dissaving by the government. That means a smaller government deficit. Or we have to invest less. Right. Well, I don't like the second one very much. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we try to do the first one? We need to get our own balance domestically, and the, the current account deficit will take care of itself in, in that world. But for the time being, the rest of the world, for perfectly understandable reasons, would rather invest here. We've got courts that work. We protect intellectual and physical property. Right. And so on. This is a good place to invest. Yeah, so that's it's not a bad thing to be a not place where people want to invest. And by the way, because all those people want to invest here, that means they generally have to buy dollars to do it. It means the dollar's strong, and it means it's hard to sell our exports abroad because they're expensive. Okay, you take the rough with the smooth. Right, and, and as we mentioned in, I think, the first episode, if you don't have that investment, then you're not going to have increases in exactly. productivity and economic growth that you need going forward. Exactly. Well, Dr. New, again, this is fascinating, and I, and I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us today. Uh, this concludes our final episode on the role of the economy in grad strategy, but I hope to bring you back again uh, sometime, Dr. New, and thanks for all that you do. I look forward to it. Thanks. Thank you. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.